trying to be a puzzle to the to the deal with those questions. And frankly, we're going to have a little fun. I'm going to ask you, I'll identify the quotes. <clears throat> First of all, Parmenides is a puzzle. It's designed as a puzzle. Your job is to figure out the nature of the puzzle. So let me ask you the first question. Do you have a sense of identifying how long it took the Cephalus to come to Athens to get a report of that dialogue of foreign entities, Socrates and Zeno? How much time would elapse? Five years? That's central. Let me put that on the back burner for a moment. So, staying only with the text, what kind of a person is Antiphon? By that I mean, is he a philosopher? Is he involved in this kind of thought? Oh, well, tell me about the nature of our good friend Antiphon. So just going into the text, what would you say? Now I'm going to build a series of questions tonight, and I'm going to ask you to pull together the answers. All right, all right, look here. I use, you're pointing to Regina, so go ahead. They're all pointing to you, so come up with an answer. About these answers? You heard the question. Uh, 15 years. 15 years? For the first question. How long did it 15, is that fair? Could it be greater, less? Could be greater. Could be greater. Could be greater? Yes. It was a long time ago when the guy was a boy. Okay. Answer the second one we need. Antiphon? <clears throat> he has a good memory. It, 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 does that answer it, by the way? He has a good memory. Everybody who has a good memory is naturally a philosopher. It helps. Isn't that true? No? No. She's right, though. It does help. It helps. Well, we know, <clears throat> we know there's a big difference between his youth and his adulthood. In youth, he studied um, I don't know what the it is. He studied it with great care. Um, I guess the Parmenides discussion they're raising their hands. They wanted to talk louder, right? Yeah. Sion said, I'm left out. Oh, thank you. So as a youth, he studied the Parmenides-Socrates dialogue with great care. But then there seems to be a change. Now he devotes most of his time to horses. So if he was Look her, look her. What does that mean? By the way, the reason you can't answer the question yet is you don't know Antiphon. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't believe he's any place, anywhere else in Plato. Sir? I don't believe he's anywhere else in Plato. Okay, no answer. He likes to give orders. He what? He likes to give orders. He says, Amphiton at home giving a smith an like, order yeah. to make a bridle. Like, How did he get involved in the Parmenidean discussion? Tell me something I need to know. It looks like he had a relationship with 
Pardon me? He had a relationship with Pythodorus. What kind of relation did he have with Pythodorus? You're quite correct. Pythodorus often repeated to him the conversation which Socrates, Zeno, and Parmenides once had together. So whatever kind of relationship it involved repeating the dialogue. Uh, That's all. Times. That's all. No, no. What can you conclude if that's all? Did it show he's a great philosopher? No. No. What does it show? That, that he could remember something if someone kept repeating it to him. Yes. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Is that right? He was a friend of Pythodorus's, but it was not present at the talk. Hey. You see? Yeah, but he studied it. Look here, see? Pythodorus, he's, he's listening to? Pythodorus. Pythodorus, again and again and again. Yep. And Pythodorus is repeating the discussion he heard. Yeah. OK, look here. Can I put this word in? He merely memorized it. it learned of the talk when someone repeated it to him. Yeah, there's no evidence he asked any questions or asked for clarification or um, and how asked, does exclaimed with wonder? Wonderful. And how does he look upon what it is he has learned? As burdensome to recall. As burdensome to recall. Hey. What does that mean? Um, he doesn't. He doesn't love it. Doesn't love it. He's not into it. He's not into it. He memorized it because someone else repeated it to him. No. What a way to introduce a dialogue. Uh, yeah. And then it shows, does it not, from the quote you just used? It's a burden for him. He even w he has them wait until he finishes with the bridle and the horse. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, now I'll do it. But at first, what's his first response? He was at first unwilling. Unwilling, no. <coughs> right? Hey, no. <laughs> now look here. What do you think of this? Here's the dialogue, Parmenides, which some people consider a very great piece of work. <coughs> and we're hearing it, we're getting it, from someone who looks upon it as a hard piece of work, difficult to recall, burdensome. But he got it from Pythodorus. Does Pythodorus show any interest in philosophy? Or is he just repeating it? Hey, separate question. Uh, why is there this reluctance to get into it as an object of love and concern and philosophy? Hey, even Parmenides considers it a hard thing to do. A hard yeah. thing to do, right? Yeah. So many people are laboring over this work, and how, how are we receiving it? from a tradition of people who are carrying it because they love it and they want to get into it? No. Good. Now we're getting close to the puzzle. Well, isn't it fair to say that as a youth, Antiphon saw some merit in it and he studied it a great deal? Pardon? He he studied it a great deal. He studied it with great care as a youth. So can't we give him the credit, though, that at least as a youth, he saw the value of this dialogue? OK. Antiphon is doing something with it. Is that your point? Yeah. It must be. He studied it with great care. Well, he's proud of the fact that he has memorized it. <laughs> as it well, as a youth. And he uses it. Not as an adult, no. Well, then what is he doing with it? Well, 
I mean, I, I agree that he's lost interest in it. But at least we can give him the credit that as a youth, he saw the merit of it. Okay. Who is he giving it? Who is, who is our friend Cephalus giving it to? An unspecified audience. We, the reader. Do we find anyone in the dialogue who's using it as an object of contemplation? Well, Cephalus. It's intended. Cephalus? Cephalus. Give me a quote. Well, is he doing it, but he's giving it to someone. Pardon me? I mean, he's giving it to Do you hear her? No, he look is, at that. Oh, they're upset. He's given it, giving it to an unspecified audience, so he is continuing it. Pardon me. Is he contemplating it? Is she another spokesman? Well, he's, he's, accompanied, he's being accompanied by fellow citizens of mine. Look, look here. I want to know whether anybody considers it an object of contemplation or love. That's all. I think Socrates is the only one. Louder. Socrates is the only one that really is into the farming into the uh, dialogue. That's right. He's the only one. That's major. We're going to go back to that. So, at this point, do you find something curious going on? That no one is considering a suitable object for contemplation. Including Aristoteles, including Aristotle. who's considered a, who's quoted as being, One of the later, is he going to be a philosopher or a tyrant? A tyrant. One of the 30 tyrants. A tyrant. It has no effect. None of this stuff has any effect on the people who are present, except Socrates. Yeah, get it from the book. Okay, second. Right, I getting for the next I question. Um, Could Parmenides have described his hypothesis in other terms and in another way than he did? Or is his, or is his way the proper and only way? Okay, now this depends upon one issue.
Hey, this one word is a fundamental word in the Parmenides, Usio. It's discussed in two and three, six and seven. It's rejected in four and five, eight and nine. What is Usio? There is no description of it in the Parmenides. It is assumed to exist, and the one, this in the second hypothesis, the one that exists participates in Usio. Hey, it is the subject. His whole effort in the second hypothesis is nothing other than to talk about meaningfully Usia without describing it. Now, what the heck is it? Nowhere does he give a description of it. Therefore, the second part, what I'd like you to do for me, is to build an idea of Usia. Right? And then you'll see the problem and the puzzle with the Parmenides. And you'll see that he could easily have done a totally different description that he gave in the Parmenides than the one he gave. So, I'll read you, I will read you a couple of lines. You make notes. Let's pull it together so you can have an idea of Lucia. <coughs> now, Plato is very careful about this term. He only describes it in book six and seven. He talks about it in terms of other aspects from eight to 10. From one to five, he loosely uses it, but with no rigor, and often contrasts it with the idea of wealth. So let's go and get a bunch of quotes on Usia. So let me give you the first and I'll tell you where it comes from. Four eighty five B five. No, no, yeah, B five. <clears throat> Here it is. We must accept as agreed this trait of the philosophical nature that is ever enamored of the kind of learning which reveals to them something of that usia which is eternal and is not wandering between the two poles of generation and decay. Again. Where is that here? Yes. Is that Repu- the Republic? Yes. Okay. Books, yeah. Book six. 485B. <clears throat> okay, got it? Read it again. <clears throat> we must accept as agreed this trait of the philosophical nature that is ever in, in love with, enamored, in love with, 
the learning, <coughs> which reveals to them something of Usia. Agree? Central? Four eighty six A. There's a further point. To be considered in distinguishing the philosophical nature from the unphilosophical. What point? You must not overlook any touch of liberality. For nothing can be more contrary to such pettiness, to the quality of a soul that, are, that is ever to seek integrity and wholeness in all things human and divine, most true. Do you think, uh, than a mind habituated to thoughts of grandeur and the contemplation of all time and usia can deem this life of a man a thing of great concern. 486. There's a better translation of that. That's a very weak one. Um, Do you think that for such a dianoia habituated to the contemplation of all time and usia can deem this life of a man of great concern? You're going to add to it, are you not? Well, there are a whole bunch that I'm passing by of the connection between Usia and Logos for a while. <clears throat> Next, 509. Three quotes on Usia. <clears throat> He's making an analogy with the sun. The sun, I presume, <coughs> you will say, not only furnishes to visibles the power of visibility, but it also provides for their generation, growth, and nurture. Though it is not itself generation, of course not. Here it is now. In a like manner, you are to say that the objects of knowledge not only receive from the presence of the good their being known, but their very, their very being and usia is derived to them from it. 
the good itself. Where does the Osea come from? Where does Osea come from? What are the properties it has? Just like the sun. What are they then? It's all the forms of generation, growth, and nurture. Would you read that last quote again? Sure. <clears throat> again, 509 B.C. The sun, I presume you will say, not only furnishes to visibles the power of visibility, but it also provides for their generation, their growth, nurture, though it is not itself generation. In a like manner, analogy, in a like manner, then you are, say, the objects of knowledge not only receive from the presence of the good their being known and their existence and usia is derived from it, though the good itself is not usia, but it transcends usia in dignity and surpassing power. Got the analogy? Usia, therefore, is the very nature of similar to the sun. It provides on a metaphysical level our growth, our power, our nurture. We're using, we're using knowledge instead of, instead of Yeah, of course. That's why they're called different translations. So the good transcends Usia in the last three words. Yeah, the yeah. good transcends Usia in yes. dignity and surpassing okay. power. Got it, Barbara? Thank yeah. you. P pass it on. Yeah. Surpassing power. Now, any quote I'm using that you want to add something to, please break in and do it. Please. And if not me, I'll okay. And that. others, others, Juan, Maria, <laughs> David, Regina, anyone, Manubuya, etc. Good. <coughs> okay. And he says, by the way, with this similitude, I'm leaving out a great deal. And that's why they have, he has to generate the allegory, oh, pardon me, the divided line and the allegory of the cave. 523, still book seven. Now, of course, everybody knows this one because we've all studied arithmetic. Here it is. <clears throat> uh, do you observe then in this study what I do? Arithmetic. Oh, what? Arithmetic. Yeah. It seems likely that is one of those studies which we are seeking that naturally conducive to the awakening of noose, of, right? Noasin. But that no one makes the right use of it. Here it comes. Though it really does tend to draw the mind to Usia. What's the goal of it? Arithmetic? To draw the mind to Usia. Five twenty five. 
Say, in which class do you uh, think number and the one belong? I don't know. I can't conceive it. Well, reason that out from what we have already been, been saying. Here it is. For if one is adequately seen by itself or apprehended by some other sensation, it would not tend to draw the mind to the apprehension of usia. Now he links, he links usia with being or antos. This study then, it would compel the soul to be at a loss and to inquire by a rousing noose in itself and to ask, whatever then is the one? And thus the study of the one will be one of the studies that guide and convert the soul to the contemplation of being, ontos. Five twenty five B five. A philosopher, because he must rise after the region of generation and lay hold on essence, or he can never become a true reckoner. Here's one now, all set. It is befitting then, Glaucon, that this branch of learning should be prescribed by law. And we should induce those who are to share the highest functions of the state to enter upon that study and to take hold of it, not as amateurs, but to follow it up until they attain to the contemplation of the nature of number by pure noose. Not for the purpose of buying, selling, but for what? For facilitating the conversion of the soul itself from the word world of generation to usia and truth. Five twenty six E. But still, for such purposes, uh, a slight study of geometry and calculation would suffice. What we have to consider is whether the greater and the more advanced part of it tends to facilitate 
the apprehension of the idea of the good. <whistles> idea of the good sneaks in. This tendency, we affirm, is to be found in all studies that force the soul to turn its vision around to that region where dwells the most blessed part of reality, which is, in, which is imperative that it should behold. Then, if it compels the soul to contemplate Usia, it is suitable. In the divided line, the word usia plays a key role. 534. I'll just read the key part. The realm of opinion. deals with generation, intellection, with Ursia. There's several other references there, but I'll skip it. Next. 534, B, C. <clears throat> The role of the dialectic and usia. Do you not also give the name dialectician to the man who is able to an exact an account of the usia of each? And will you not say that the one who is unable to do this insofar as he is incapable of rendering an account of himself and others, does not possess full reason and intelligence. The man who is unable to define in his discourse and distinguish an abstract from all other things, an idea of the good, who cannot, as it were, in battle, running the gauntlet of all tests, and striving to examine by usia, and not by opinion, and hold on his way through all without tripping in his reasoning. The man who lacks this power doesn't know the good itself, or any particular good, of all tests and striving to examine everything by Usia. Skip, Book 8, 551. Now, this is where our translator chooses to use the word usia as property. We don't have to do that.
and proclaiming that no man shall hold office whose usiyad does not come up to the required valuation. Hey, his osia has to come up to the proper evaluation. Curious. Look at another one. 533, 553, B5. Now, the property of osia you can develop and lose. Okay, now we're into the oligarchical type. It is likely, and my son, my friend, after seeing and suffering all these things and losing his usia, grows timid. You can gain and you can lose it. So, look, there are um, about ten references to Usia books, one to five, and I'm skipping that because the central part of Usia is discussed, book six, seven, and I jumped then to book eight. Okay? What did you find? What is Usia? What would you, what would you say? Benefit by having it. Object of contemplation. Always, again and again and again. Something that grows, you participate in. How central is it to his development? It's very central to the development of mind. In the Parmenides, there is no discussion of Usia. It exists, and then he explores the consequences of it metaphysically. I went into the Republic to pull it out. Can you come up now with an idea of Usia? There's one I left out, darn it. Don't worry, I left it out. Book six. Ah. Uh. He draws the idea of Usia to light, but I, I don't have the quote. It's in book six. I'll pull it out next time. Okay. Pull it together now. What would you say is this curious term? How important is it? How does it function? Should we not, Barbara, should we not get volunteers? Definitely. Yeah, Nancy? She said she's working on it. Okay, take, a minute, take 10 minutes out, pull it together. Keep it here, okay? What do you got? Good? Want to share it? Well, 
Well, it seems like Ursia is the function of Nus. Yes. When Nus gets aroused, uh -huh. it Ursias. Therefore, Hear that? Do it again. When that usia is a function of noose, and when noose gets aroused, mm. it usias. <laughs> it it usias. Right. What, it's, what is its relationship to the idea of the good? Remember that quote? David? As the sun is to the visible and its nurture, so the good is to knowledge and its usia. What do you think about that? That's good. Um, that usia is not knowledge or the good but um, something that is fundamental to the, um, the function and activity of knowledge in the good. How would you put it? David gave a good one. You do it? Thank you. Who do you want to call help on? Sam? Sam? Should you not get it? But you were called on for help. Uh, I don't have any help to offer right now. Sorry. <laughs> Look here. <clears throat> the idea of the good in the Republic is called Divine luminosity. What's the connection between the idea of the good then and Usia? Remember the quote? David gave a good start, yes. Are you referring to 526E? 5. 526E, the one on. 520, pardon me. 526E? 509. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I know you did 509, but the, the one with the, that links idea of good in the blessed part of reality and, and we see it as 526. Right, right. And, uh, I don't have the text, so I had to write down the quote, but so as geometry, geometry would be the right study if it tends to facilitate the contemplation of the idea of the good, the most brilliant light of being. Um, no, I don't, I didn't get the quite, the whole quote. 
but if geometry um, is moving towards a contemplation of Lucia, then it's suitable for facilitating uh, grasping of the idea of the good. Therefore, go ahead. By contemplating Lucia. Yeah. Well, first of all, it sounds like Lucia and the idea of the good are not the same. Go ahead. But if you are, if whatever, if geometry is directing you towards the contemplation of Lucia, then that would be a correct study for you to be drawn to the idea of the good. It's like it's some. It's a good relation. No. In some way they're connected, but we don't have it yet. Okay. David? Is Lucia, um, the idea of the good is, Lucia is the link between the good and the idea of the good. Yes. Is, is, is okay, Lucia, look. Is, is Hold it just for a moment. Kind of a mean yeah. something. Is that right? Come on. We're, we're looking at the same quote. What, what's the quote that makes it the mean? Which quote is it that makes it the mean? I'm, I'm back in 519. Which, what does that one say? There are three quotes. Um, Man furnishes to the visible the power of the, vis, uh, 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 of the visible providing generation growth itself generation growth and nurture and the good provides objects of knowledge um, let's see the good the objects of knowledge received from the presence of the good are uh, the capabilities to be known and its existence and its lucia derived from the good uh, but transcending, but providing from the good, but transcending Lucia in dignity and surpassing power. So the good transcends Lucia in dignity and transcends in power, uh, but its presence provides the idea of the good with its capability of being known. So I have it as a mean. I don't remember it. See, um, <clears throat> let's do it again. Please fix that for me. But still, for such purposes, a slight modicum of geometry and calculation would suffice. What we have to consider <clears throat> is whether the greater and more advanced part of it tends to facilitate the apprehension of the idea of the good. Hmm. That tendency, we affirm, is to be found in all the studies that force the soul to turn its vision around to the region where dwells the most blessed part of reality, which is imperative that it should behold. Then, if it compels the soul to contemplate or see it, it's suitable, if not, not. Contemplation of Usia should do what? 
should facilitate or force the soul to turn its vision, which the most blessed part of reality is, it's imperative to be seen. And what will that do? It should help us tend to facilitate the apprehension of the idea of the good. You need, see, you need a better quote. You got the puzzle in there. He's not making it so definitive that you can do this yet. Right? He lays it out. Yeah, 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 that's true. But how does it differ? In the Parmenides, he does not describe the idea of the good anywhere. Central idea in the Republic. That's what must be seen. That all they have in common is Yeshua. So two dialogues. I mean. That's right. And contemplation of relationship. Okay, let's hear some. Yes, yes, yes. yes, because Usia is also linked with truth. Yes. And the nature of reality. It will also be in itself and in others. End of book six. Key quote. Often quoted, 509b. <clears throat> the sun, I presume you will say, not only furnishes to visibles the power of visibility, but it also provides for their generation, growth, and nurture. Though it's not a self-generation. In like manner, you are to say that the objects of knowledge not only receive their presence of the good, their being known, but their very being and usia is derived to them from it, though it's not the good itself. It's not essence, but still transcends essence and dignity and power. It not only receives from the presence of the good, their being known, but their very being and usia comes from it. So hey, look. Right. Above this is the good. No doubt. And how is it described? Similar to the sun? 
But from that, all generation, growth, nurture. We see it as ex just the same thing. Then it supplies to the soul its own development, growth, and nurture. As it were, it's the substance of growth of the soul. And if you extend that, if it is like the sun, well, as the sun makes everything visible, right? What is like the sun in the land of Usia? We're back to this idea of brilliance, what he called most blessed thing to see. He calls it the similitude of the sun. Now, now what would you say? I'm doing this to, to dramatize the problem of Usia. It plays an absolute essential role in the Parmenides. But he never describes it. In any of these terms, he never describes Usia in the Parmenides. So, would you agree someone might study the Parmenides as an object of <clears throat> memory, certain intellectual interest, <clears throat> but have no love for it, or wonder, or turning it philosophically? Does Parmenides, he has this, it's his hypothesis. What is he doing? What's his goal? He's got one goal. He's Socrates, you are totally misunderstanding the problem of participation. That's the whole problem and puzzle of the Parmenides. We can do it this way now. Next, <clears throat> look here. Participation, participation in Usia. Nowhere else except its denial, six and seven. Parmenides is listening to Socrates and he says, you know what? Kid, you have one problem. You have an idea of participation. It's wrong. That's the whole thing. So we have to see 
what Socrates' position is on participation and see the difference in Parmenides. That's all. And then apply it to our model. So look here. Parmenides says, hey, Socrates, you discovered a great idea. You know, you discovered it. That <clears throat> Their ideas I'll just use one greatness. You see now what? He said, you look at things, mountains, and you say, hey, that's a great one. Oh, he looks at trees. Oh, that's a great one. Wow. He said, you know what? Everything is great participates in the idea of greatness. Hey. Uh, Brad showed me how to draw flowers. Beautiful flower. Oh, it participates in beauty. This is what everybody teaches in all the universities is Plato's theory of ideas. It's bullshit. <laughs> totally misunderstands this word, participation. This whole thing <clears throat> is designed for that one purpose, to show Socrates as his idea of participation is fundamentally wrong. That's his goal. Therefore, everything in the model has that one purpose. If he had said, by the way, <clears throat> there's an idea of contemplation. I have a friend of mine, he contemplates all the time money. Hey, no joke. He has it on his mind all day long. He's in the banking. He spends his whole life numbers, percentages. He's a banker. Totally contemplating. Training his mind for that one thing. He understands contemplation. By the way, could Parmenides have gone over to him and said, hey, you know what? <clears throat> you have a problem. Your idea of contemplation is incorrect. Could he not develop an idea of contemplation based upon Usia? Could he not then use his own model with a different language? Because all of the ideas involved in this idea of participation, all of the ideas, all the ideas that are central to his idea of participation are the 14 ideas 
that repeat themselves as the key ideas in the examination of all of these hypotheses. That's where he gets his terms. Look, we do not agree. That tree is great. Oh, that's because you see a sameness between this object and the idea of greatness, do you not? Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's build a vocabulary to talk about this. By the way, wouldn't you agree there's many things that are great, but there's only one idea of greatness? Come on, this is good. Come on. How many ideas are presupposed in Socrates' idea of participation in this model? The idea is same? Other? Part and whole. Problem of equal, not unequal? Part, part and whole. Part and whole? are all the terms that he uses to show Socrates that he is using the terms in the wrong arena in generation. And he wants to show him the correct way of using these terms. Where? Now look here. Why does he have so many hypotheses? Why not one? Why not show the kid, hey, look, uh, I'll take a few minutes and I'll point out all the ideas that you assume must exist for your idea participation. I'll show you the correct way to use them in the world of ideas when we're talking about Usia and the one. Wouldn't take long. Why does he why does he develop? Now, I'll give you the first easy answer. In dialectic, whatever you propose, you should also argue against its opposite. Is not. So that's why he needs six, seven, eight, nine. <sighs> now, since I've done half, I need help from you. Why does he have two, three, four, five? Only one reason. Who's still? Because he misses. See, this, this in principle is false. He shows that in the beautiful argument of the master and slave. All the language you use to understand your world is true in your world only, but it's not true in reality. And what does he mean by reality? Who soon? So therefore, <clears throat> do you find it interesting that this whole discussion could go on into metaphysics? Why is it that Parmenides is originally reluctant to go through it all? They urge him. Because he knows the sea of words that lie ahead of him. Because it's only serving one purpose. Socrates' problem of participation. We can develop this model. Only we'll use it 
for a language we can develop out of the Republic as an object of contemplation. That's not his goal. He said, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take this kid Socrates through this whole thing. Oh well, I'll do it. Would it not have been different had Socrates had come up to him with the problem of contemplation? Then he would have had to explore it in terms of the Republic, would he not? And Usia. But he doesn't. Therefore, it's boring. What he's just doing is repeating an exercise in the dialectic that will help Socrates with this problem, and that's the only thing he's doing. He's leaving for us the problem to do it in respect to the Republic and Usia. And what's the most important thing for me right now? Coffee. Does it drink? I should call it Saturn. Saturn Day. That's what it is. Tomorrow is called Saturday. It's really Saturn Day. Great. Thank you. This is the idea of greatness. That's a great mountain, is it not? And these are lesser, but this is greater compared to the others, but is not as great. The more these things participate in the idea, the more they become, and they are it. Great. Right? The more or less you participate in the idea, <coughs> the more or less they become more ideal, like the idea. <clears throat> Things are simple. For the idea of greatness, you can change it, put beauty, or any of the other so-called ideas. Therefore, the idea is separate from things, and things participate in it. And they more or less they participate in it, so they become.
Right? So Prime Minister says, hey, uh, <clears throat> real nice, would you say the same thing is true of man? And fire? He says, no, I'm a little, a little puzzled about that because uh, <clears throat> if that's true, then men would differ to the degree they participate in man. Some would be more or less men. No, I, I get puzzled when I think about. He said, hey, what about hair? Uh, mud and dirt. Are there ideas of that? If so, the more they participated in, the dirtier the dirt would get. <laughs> he says, uh, I get confused. At this point, I run away. <clears throat> he says, you know your problem? So he says, you know, you haven't thought about it. You see, look at this. The word participate means taking a part. The action of partaking, the object, the process of taking apart is partaking. He said, look here, if this is an idea of greatness, well, you can participate in just a little bit of it, right? Because you're only taking only a part of it. But if you only take a little part of greatness, how great would it be? Yeah. He said, oh, he said, maybe you participate in the whole of it. Oh, then that whole thing would be in the thing, wouldn't it? But if the whole thing were in the thing, there wouldn't wouldn't allow anything else to participate in greatness if the whole thing is in the one thing, yeah, that's true. How about the idea of smallness? The idea of smallness? No. Well, if you only take a small bit of smallness, then you're real tiny, aren't you? Yeah, that would follow. Then the thing you're talking about would be greater than the thing you're participating in. So Socrates says, maybe uh, this is just an idea. Uh, in my mind, a thought. So he abandons this idea and he takes this one. He says, oh, 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 oh. Then uh, whatever idea you have in your mind, uh, that idea If it is what it is, then it must think. I mean, that's what an idea is in the mind, isn't it? Things that think. Oh, then if things, if things participate in it, then they participate in something that thinks. Oh, then the thing must think. Garbage can thinks.
this, this ruinous idea. It's all like you haven't even come close to understanding the difficulties of this. That's your problem, Socrates. Just look here. Now look here, we got two realms. Your world, the realm of reality, or the divine and the gods. There's now look, in your world, you have things like uh, master-slave. By the way, you can use that Master slave over here too. By the way, how much art would you need in order to be a master of a slave? Art? Did you say art? Well, you need to have a strong fist, right? Yeah, that's a whip, yeah. You have to do what do you have to do to make the slave? Tyrannize him, must you not? Subject him. And then he becomes a willing slave rather than give up his life. You say, look here, there is mastership over here, but it presupposes uh, a master saying, this is the same as master and student. It presupposes an art. So the real master must have an art that can benefit a student. That's not over here. Your language, your language and ideas built up from your world fits your world. But you know what? You need another vocabulary over here, or you have to see that the key terms here have a totally different understanding here. And if you don't see that, then you're totally confused. Here, to nurture. Over here, to nurture. Same or different? To, nature, to nurture oneself physically, you have to do a certain number of things. Are they the same things for nurturing the soul? Or different? Different. You're saying, Pierre, are you saying that we use this, we, in the reality in your world, there are uh, physical things. In the other world that you're talking about, the realm of reality, those things are used as terms in an analogy. They seem to be analogous, but they're a different order. Uh -huh. Like he says over here, remember in the quotes that we used, over here is the sun, and the sun allows all generation, allows growth, development, nurturing, and so things grow through the power of the sun. By the way, over here, the things that <clears throat> bring about growth, developing, and nurture is not the physical sun. But there is something over here that brings about 
the development of the soul. That's your sin. What does it do? <laughs> so the language that we have is it's really a shadow of the real value of the terms on the metaphysical or spiritual level. And unless you understand that, you're not understanding language. He says, you know your problem there for Socrates? Language. Your problem is language. You picked up these terms, and especially the word participate. He used the word participate to explain everything here. So Parmenides says, you don't understand what participation is. The one participates in usia. The one that is, it participates in usia. You put in everything you know from the Republic about usia. He's saying, there is a realm. It's this realm. It's this realm. Now, there's something interesting about that realm that it participates in Osir. He first has to talk about what that means and then how it participates. How is the third hypothesis. The nature of it is the second hypothesis. Now, you can have the appearance of Usia because this is a work on the appearance and reality. The nature of reality and the nature of appearance. This is the level of reality. This is the re level of appearance. Therefore, the appearance of Usia, that's for, it's not reality, it's the appearance of it. And if you want to talk about how it appears, the condition for it, is five, just like two, three is to two, five is to four. By the way, if we're right on, we're saying that there's a necessary connection between these two. That is, if you deny the idea of the one in two, three, four, and five, you have six, seven, eight, nine. That's all. So look here. We're going to do something in addition. We're going to go through this, this way, and then we're going to raise a question. That is, two, three, four, five, we are going to say are the spiritual, religious, or philosophical, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> positions, the fundamental ones, 
These are only these are the fundamental positions. What we would like to know is, is it possible that if we can talk about people being in each one of these, What would happen if a four, a fourer, fourth hypothesis, what if they were subjected to understanding its denial? Is it possible that may undermine their loyalty to four? If so, is there some way of reasoning in this model where they may go and why? Is it possible if you're a fiver and you understand the opposite, it's denial, that you may want to get out? Is it possible that you can then reason your way through and see that he wouldn't go to four but he would go to three? I'm suggesting an alternative now to our model. <clears throat> because this is what we will need. Four by four. <clears throat> In every system, metaphysical, religious, philosophical system, you can understand your system symbolically. Or you can take it more literally so that if you are a fourer, this would be a lower, this would be a higher or symbolic. This would be a higher, right? This would be a lower. And so you can make this design, and we can say, given this kind of a diagram, can we anticipate where each of these people would go given their exposure to the opposites in their own system? Could we predict where a fiver would go? Would a four? With a three-er, with a two-er? Is it possible in two, three, four, and five, you have thinkers who are progressive, right? who understand their system not literally, but on a higher philosophical level? Yes. Could they not also take it literally lower? Can we present that in our model? If we can, can we predict the possible motion and movement the four, three, four, and five might go through? Same thing for the negative side. So that's where we're going. So let me hold up for a while and then get you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, 
So going back to Socrates's Good. problem. So according to your model, we can say that um, the way he understands ideas and participation, he's um, on the level of four and five. Yes, yes. Parmenides, through his dialectic, wants to get him to two and three. That's right. That's right. And so then if we... He is a combination of four and five. <coughs> yes, go ahead. And if we were to try to resolve his problem of, like, your world, realm of reality, we have to understand... What are the terms that we could um, relate two, three, to four, or five? What are the terms in three, four, and five? Well, between two, three, and four, or five, like his one of Parmenides' ideas is: is it completely separate? Like you can't even know the gods because mm -hmm. you know it's all argument. So that would make two, three separate from four, or five. But it, we need to, and then the Socrates' idea of participation from four or five to two or three doesn't work. That's so right. So we need some kind of, another theory mm -hmm. to relate two, three to four or five. Um, or four or five to two or three. See, with Socrates, the problem would be, <coughs> which is good that you're anticipating it, see. If he understands this, Then I'd go to the first hypothesis. Because none of these are true. So then you don't even look so you, you don't even bother look. trying to relate two, three, to four, five. It's not See, true. The one that is participates in Usia. Well, what the hell is the one? It ain't there. Yeah. So, if Socrates was led through this, he would see the error in his thinking. And this whole thing then would be laid out for him. And he could then say, hmm, every one of these are equal. In what sense equal? Because there's a, it's opposite that can be said equally. They can nullify one another. Therefore, two, three, four, and five can be nullified by six, seven, eight, nine. Therefore, you could say, I want to get to the one. But we're going to hold that up because we're going to go into um, Mahayana Buddhism for one. Their position is nirvana and samsara are the same. No difference. But we'll get there when we get into the one, okay? Okay, let's go there. Okay? Good. Thank Tomorrow? You. Thank you. Thank you. Hold it, Barbara. Hold it. Now, if any of you want to work on any of these arguments that preceded the hypothesis, get ready to ask questions tomorrow morning.
Here, you hold it. I'll hold it. Oh, I'll just put it over here. Come over here. You hold okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A sandwich board. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.